Take a minute to stretch your legs if you'd like, even to step away from your computer for a moment. It's really fine to do. So for you, for those of you I don't know yet, my name is Shelley Graff and I'm one of the guiding teachers here at Common Ground and um, Mark is away on retreat this month so I'll be leading these Sunday morning practice groups for him. He'll be back in December. He'll actually be uh, teaching at the Forest Refuge in December but he'll be available on Sunday mornings to lead these so he'll be back in, in December. So I wanted to have a conversation today about the power of retreating. And it may seem um, different to begin this way, but I feel really compelled to uh, understanding, oh, yeah, just the power of the teachings in everyday life. And even more than ever, this moment that we're living in really feels like it calls for the most integration, right? to be in relationship with all parts of ourselves and each other and all the humanity that's expressed both in our own hearts and our families, in our communities and in the, in the world, which is a, is a tall order like to find a way to embrace it all right? and to not somehow compartmentalize like practices for we to practice in this way you know like i'm practicing when i'm sitting and not for the rest of my day or i'm practicing when i'm on retreat and not for the rest of my life but to really see how the power of the teachings manifest and are available to us all the time. Right? So what does it mean to be, to value the power of a container, an intense retreat container while we're washing dishes or while we're taking care of our kids or while we're feeling our own psychological pain and woundedness or while we're in despair about one thing or another? You know, what does it mean to bring the power of the teachings to bring the power even of the container or perhaps to even broaden the container so that the it surrounds our whole lives all of who we are and so when i when i say i want to talk about the power of retreating i'm really creating a broad sense of how we might relate to that idea the power of retreating and it's not new you know, for all of us, we might have a taste in our mouth of the power of the potency of a container that we create for ourselves, right? Even coming to a Sunday morning practice group like this is a kind of retreat, right? Deciding to sit for half an hour is a kind of retreat, right? Because we've made a decision based on our some intentions that we've had prior to coming here some intentions about how we wanted to be or how we wanted to live or what practice might mean to us. And so even when we could be doing other things, we decide to come here, right? So if I asked you just now for a, a quick snapshot of what's in the room, uh, I'd be curious to hear what you'd say. What have you learned already? through the power of a container, through the power of returning to a program or returning to your cushion or returning to presence, to wholehearted presence in your life. Our practice 
both on the cushion and when we dedicate time, when we bring forward our intentions, when we find some way to manifest the intentions that we have for living a wholesome life, for living a skillful life, for being as competent as we possibly can, it's really powerful, right? The container, because it is power, it's a powerful container because it's already infused with our intentions, right? So our sit is a powerful container of uh, the, the posture, for example, is a powerful kind of container because we're here to learn, right? It doesn't mean that every moment's pleasant when we're here to learn. It doesn't mean that we sit down and because of the power of the container, everything becomes blissful. We all know that's not true, right? The going on a retreat, carving out a few hours or a day or a few days or longer to go inward is another kind of powerful container, right? And it's a powerful container because of the remembering to return to our intentions, to be wholehearted, right? to understand something or to feel. Right? And in this way, our whole lives can become a powerful container for us because every moment, because of every moment that we remember to trust sensitivity or to trust this heart's capacity to feel and not somehow think that living competently and resiliently and equanimously is somehow going to be built by chasing every shiny object right? or somehow disconnecting from the things that are painful or somehow negating what's beautiful even in a moment when life feels like it's immense. And this is really a path of renunciation. So when I talk about the power of a container, it's hard to, to actually talk about the power of a container that's infused with our intentions to be present, to be sensitive, to understand the value of sensitivity without remembering that while we do that, other things fall away naturally. So when we, when I mention renunciation it can sometimes feel like a downer, right? Like I have to let go of to do something to let go of something, right? And although that might be true and it might be really skill, skillful, remembering that with patience and time and the steady remembering that the heart actually renunciates on its own, right? The Buddha was interested in the internal in earn, in developing an internal capacity to know deeply, to feel deeply, to be connected with all things. And on this Buddhist path, the external actually reflects the internal, right? So how do we change our lives? How do we change our communities? How do we become a more loving family? Well, it's by cultivating this inner capacity for sensitivity and a natural, uh, a natural kind of renunciation that happens when we decide to be wholehearted in our lives. Decide to be wholehearted, decide to, when we remember to return to our intentions in each moment of our lives, even in the ordinary, right? Especially in the ordinary. I still remember um, one of my earliest retreat experiences eating a bowl of oatmeal that was fairly bland, right? I think probably just oatmeal and maybe some stewed prunes, which if you've been on retreat, you know, that's just usually what's cooked. And so this, the power of just accepting whatever is cooked, you just eat that, right? Without complaining, that's all there is. So there's no sense in really uh, wanting more, you know, the heart kind of learns that naturally that there's no sense of wanting something different because this is what's offered, sweetie. So you're going to eat this, right? And actually as the heart like accepted that reality, oh, it's oatmeal and stewed prunes and decided to be there with the experience, this fairly bland meal was rich. 
actually the the mouth was alive with flavor yeah and there was an understanding in the heart of acceptance and renunciation right so it wasn't something that the heart decided you know like i need to really develop a program so that i can learn to let go it was the power of the container and the intentions to be present and trusting the sensitivity in that moment that actually allowed for that expression of richness to be there the feeling of richness the appreciation of the people who cook the meal and you know all of all of the conditions that supported being there in that retreat and so we might think about going you know this idea or the the uh, practice of going for refuge as one of learning what the most important thing is and learning to return to the most important thing and that's something that we can do independent of whether we're sitting or walking or tending to our kids or working or buying groceries we can remember like, oh, what's the most important thing here? What's the most important thing here? That's in some ways, if I, we could pull the room to see why you all came, but there would be some flavor of the most important thing. Somehow this is important to you, this practice, this returning, this remembering, this valuing a container that we're co-creating here together. Right? And so in a moment of eating a bowl of fairly bland oatmeal, it, the most important thing become, became, became vibrant. Ah, acceptance, not fighting what's here, right? Realizing this is nature, this, the conditions that have supported this arising for me to be here at this table with the oatmeal, like the farmers, the people in the kitchen, the community that's supporting my partner at home, right? That gave me the space, the time off of work, all of that, the land, the people who have stewarded the land, indigenous communities from throughout time in a single moment of eating a bland bowl of oatmeal, when the intentions creep in, when the intent, like when the heart is full and sensitive, then it becomes possible to be really wholehearted. Yeah. To be really wholehearted and to remember the most important thing, taking refuge in this mind that can be sensitive and can know the truth of not controlling, of feeling into nature, of not resisting, in the beauty of the interconnected reality that we're living in, which we might call Sangha right? Buddha, this heart that knows truth, reality, in the midst of other people, interconnected with other beings who care deeply about waking up and knowing also. And it's kind of a, a really beautiful thing to experience or to imagine when we're wholehearted, right? We're such safety-seeking creatures. We create all these for really good reason, right? And often we create boundaries in our hearts that aren't necessary in every moment. Safety seeking boundaries like denial and distraction. You know, we're really good at this. So we're really good at living this way. But as a, as a different kind of move, we move towards trusting the heart sensitivity instead of relying on these we, we rely on sensitivity cr to create that sense of safety that is really expanded. The safety of deep, sustainable trust in the movement of all experience, in what's in not controlling, in knowing we have no control, we can only take care, right? for example. And no, noticing that and knowing that chasing every pleasant experience or trying to avoid every difficult experience is just gonna trap us in some ways 
it's we're going to find ourselves into the trap because we can't at some at some time in life we're not going to be able to only notice pleasant and we're not going to be able to get away from what's unpleasant so so finding ways to really appreciate the container and the natural kind of renunciation that happens when we are wholehearted in life is such a powerful way to live. And it doesn't mean that we won't notice those safety seeking qualities of heart that show up often, right? Because renunciation happens with time. It's not even a kind of doing that we have to, you know, it's not like we have to develop a, a way to do the path. At some point, the path really does itself. As we continue to remember the most important thing, as we continue to reconnect and trust sensitivity, even if we don't understand what we're doing. I mean, nod your head if there are like a thousand moments in the day that you feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just a confused human being right now. I'm going to do the next right thing. I know that I will, but I don't really know what I'm doing here. And that's a, that's a real important part of the path because it's in these moments of conflict that we start to understand something about our own competency, our own resiliency. We might think about the path actually as a development of our own competency with sensitivity, not because we're avoiding sensitivity. Yeah. I love this <clears throat> story that I've heard Gil Fransdahl tell. Gil is a teacher in California, Insight Meditation Center, Insight Retreat Center, and he is I've heard him tell the story about uh, another teacher, actually, Suzuki Roshi. And uh, apparently a student of Suzuki Roshi's listened to a, a Dharma talk that he offered. And Suzuki Roshi, Roshi is a Zen teacher and said, you know, raised his hand at the end and said, you know, if I practice in the way you're instructing me, will I become enlightened? And the response was, well, if your practice is sincere, it's almost as good. And what I appreciate about that is that, you know, this call to be wholehearted, whatever we're doing, wherever we are in any moment. And I might call this capacity to be sensitive and actually be in the world sensitive and actually be in our lives as a kind of competency, a capability. And why is this? You know, why is it that we it's easy? It becomes easier with time and sincerity to become more capable. Well, this is the power of renunciation at work, right? Because we learn that those safety seeking mechanisms aren't needed so much. And we don't have to even try to set something down. Things just naturally fall away. Like you might have noticed that it wasn't actually that hard to come here on Sunday morning. And it, because it feels good and there's some benefit. And the heart that knows that it feels good and that there's some benefit will keep returning to that will keep remembering to cultivate the internal habits, the internal skill to support sensitivity, right? Sometimes, you know, I can notice this in a moment with my partner, we might be having an, an argument or not even an argument, sometimes just a conversation that feels like we're both you know, it feels like we're both, this happened just this morning, actually, we're both really uh, impa impassioned about something, right? And neither, we're, you know, we're not opposing each other, but just the kind of heat that rises to the surface. I could feel 
the, I could feel it in my body, right? Because of this training to be wholehearted in every moment, to value the power of a container that's being developed moment by moment by moment in every aspect of my life. So in this moment, you know, feeling the impassioned views that are both here, and then this instinct to want to assert some power or control, like there's got to be one way and it's probably my way, right? But instead of following that and acting on it, sort of trying to control something, hold on to something that's in motion, like a view or a feeling or even a moment or another being that's growing and changing right in front of me, instead of doing that, watching that energy come to the fore, right, rise in the body, and then just deciding not to act on it, not to say something, just to let it be there, right? That's the power of renunciation. It's not because I had like a five-step approach to be a good partner in a particular moment, although there's nothing wrong with that, right? But the power of this internal, that, uh, the internal that expresses itself in the external, right? The internal capacity to be with, to trust, sensitivity is the most important thing to trust Buddha that knows Dhamma right here, that, that knows this is not mine, there's no sense in holding on, that this is in motion, ah, right here in this moment in relationship with another being who I care about, did the work on its own, right? I didn't pick up blame or asserting power or domination in that moment. I didn't pick that up. Right? The heart didn't pick that up because it's learning to trust this instead. It's learning to trust this sensitivity. And, you know, it's surprising that practice can be so vibrant and so alive in so many ordinary moments. I mean, how many times do we have impassioned conversations with people that we care about? Well, probably every day, right? Even if it's small things, like we're giving our children some direction, we want them to, we want our children to do what we're asking them to do, right? Or when we're trying to live in some kind of harmonious way in our work environments, we all have our roles and, you know, do what we do and somehow it works together. And we have these little collisions and moments where we don't like the way someone else moved or did something. And so there's, it's so ordinary that we often just kind of gloss right over it. But if we're, if we're committing to a broad container that includes all of who we are, these are really important moments to take pause and just feel like, oh, I'm making a choice to not take the bait in this moment. Yeah. I'm making a choice to live, to feel this and not pretend that this doesn't exist, right? To feel what's moving in the heart, to feel its expression in the body, to feel how we co-create a reality together. Me and my coworker in this moment, I did something they didn't appreciate, yet we're not going to argue about it. We're just going to, you know, keep going. That's an, an amazing moment. This also happened last week as I was kind of thinking about um, this talk and what I might say. These power, these are powerful moments not to disconnect from the heart, but to feel Ah, you know, we're making, I'm making a choice here to live out my values. And that doesn't mean that I will have something to say in every moment, but it does mean that I choose to keep feeling and not disconnect and then appreciate that we have a role to play. And somehow we're going to keep doing this dance of creating harmony and not throwing each other out of our hearts. You know, that's my work to not throw another human being out of my hearts in a moment where there's some kind of disagreement or rub. And the container then supports 
a returning to a commitment to be integrated, to live in such a way or to, to value the experiences in my life because they bring me closer to truth, right? And to not somehow go like, well, you know, now I'm just gonna let my mind, I'm just gonna let my mind be disconnected because this hurts. Or I'm just gonna, you know, say something that I might later regret because I deserve it and I'll practice with it later. When I'm on the cushion or when I get home or when I have a little more space, right? We do this so often but rather to be a practitioner who cares about being competent and skillful and sensitive right there in that moment of our lives, whatever we choose to do with it, right? Whatever decisions that we make, I'm not gonna negate that I'm a practitioner here. Gil Fransdahl again calls practice in this way, staying in the gravitational pull towards freedom. It doesn't mean that we might, that we necessarily feel free. We might feel like we're kind of a mess or we might feel like this is kind of impossible for human beings to live harmoniously together. Or we might feel like this is really so painful that I can hardly bear it. But the heart that values sensitivity feels that and isn't scared of it because it's an alignment with the deepest thing, with the most important thing. And I feel like this life that we're living together right now really calls us here to be in contact with the most important thing in all the moments of our lives. The stakes are high for us. And so really hoping that we can together keep remembering to return to an appreciation, a value of sensitivity in our lives, even when it feels hard, right? And to see, to get to know, to be curious about the power of renunciation, even when we're not trying, when we recognize like, oh, I'm not picking something up. I'm not picking up that unskillful habit. This is what the Buddha's interest was in renunciation. It wasn't, you know, it was the renunciation of unskillful habits. The renunciation of that which doesn't benefit each of us, our families, our relationships, us in the collective. And so we can together be curious about that. How does sensitivity support that? Me not picking something up or picking something up that feels useful, like picking up the skillfulness of interconnectedness. This is what I felt with my coworker. Like, oh, even though I'm not gonna pick up this heart pain and have a, like bring it forward into my work right now, I am gonna pick up this reality that we are interconnected and that we are doing something together and that learning how to stay in relationship with each other really matters, right? Because we need each other. So renunciation can support both not picking something up and also picking up what's useful and what's beneficial. Like sensitivity, like a return to sensitivity. So I want to read a poem before we end. This is one of my favorites. This is a something by Louise Erdrich. Erdrich. Oh, the, the title escapes, it's called Advice to Myself. <clears throat> Leave the dishes, let the celery rot in the bottom drawer of the refrigerator and an earthen scum harden on the kitchen floor Leave the black crumbs in the bottom of the toaster. Throw the cracked bowl out and don't patch the cup. Don't patch anything. Don't mend. Buy safety pins. Don't even sew on a button. Let the wind have its way. Then the earth that invades as dust. And then the dead foaming up in gray rolls underneath the couch. 
Talk to them. Tell them they are welcome. Don't keep all the pieces of the puzzles or the doll's tiny shoes and pairs. Don't worry who uses whose toothbrush or if anything matches at all. Accept one word to another or a thought. Pursue the authentic. Decide first what is authentic. Then go after it with all your heart. Your heart. That place you don't even think of cleaning out. That closet stuffed with savage mementos. Don't sort the paper clips from screws, from saved baby teeth, or worry if we're all eating cereal for dinner again. Don't answer the telephone, ever. Or weep over anything that breaks. Pink molds will, go, will grow within those sealed cartons in the refrigerator. Accept new life forms. And talk to the dead, who drift in through the screen windows, who collect patiently on the tops of food jars and books. Recycle the mail. Don't read it. Don't read anything. Accept what destroys the insulation between yourself and your experience, or what pulls down, or what strikes at, or what shatters this ruse you call necessity. Thanks everyone for your kind and patient attention.